This week on Quadriga, anti-migrant violence, mob rule in Saxony. Anti-migrant attacks have grown frequent in the German state. Last week, an angry mob chanted, go home, go home, as refugees arrived in the small town of Klausnitz. Just a short while later, an arson attack in Bautzen, also in Saxony. As a planned refugee shelter burned, onlookers cheered and tried to block the work of the fire service. There have already been more than 100 attacks on refugees so far this year in Germany. Saxony is one of the key flashpoints. Why is there such a potential for violence in German society? And how can the racist mob be stopped? Coming to you from Berlin, Quadriga, the international debate. Your host this week, Melinda Crane. Hello and welcome. Is that potential for violence unique to Saxony, or is it a problem in Germany as a whole? That's one of the things we want to talk about on Quadriga today with three people who are following events in Saxony very closely. It's a pleasure to welcome my colleague Fabian von der Mark. He is DW's correspondent for domestic politics and security matters. He just came back from Saxony, where he reported on the latest incidents, and he says the government in Saxony still hasn't understood that the fight against xenophobic violence is a major task and it needs a proper plan. And it's a pleasure to welcome Alan Posner back to the show. He's a commentator for the German newspaper Die Welt. He says you can find stupid people anywhere in Europe. The really dangerous people are the intellectuals who use the mob for their own purposes. And finally, we're happy to welcome Mikonin Miskena. He's an expert for migration and diversity at the Heinrich Böll Foundation here in Berlin. He says the mainstream politicians talk of a flood of refugees, of upper limits and Islamization. All of that is fuel on the fire of right-wing extremism. Fabian von der Mark, take us to Saxony, if you would. What is behind the violence there? Who is this mob? It's difficult to say, really. I mean, at the moment, there is still investigation who, who exactly is behind this, uh, those incidents. But it leads us already pretty to the core of our discussion, I think, because there's a whole scale of explanations who these people are. It reaches from extremist right-wing radicalized, almost terroristical people towards angry, normal citizens and somewhere in between these poles, uh, you have to search for those people. What we do know is it was about 100 people that surrounded this bus, and it was a smaller group in Bautzen. In Bautzen, for example, where the um, refugee shelter burned, um, you had before thir more than 30 anti-refugee initiatives. So it's pretty likely that people come from this uh, background, but uh, you don't know exactly who those offenders were. And why Saxony? What's wrong with Saxony? It has been the site of 20% of all xenophobic attacks over the past year, although in fact it's only taking 5% of the refugees. So what's going on? Yeah, it's interesting really. When you talk to people, and I talk to many people there, to scientists, to politicians, to ordinary people on the street, you get a whole bunch of explanations. And some of the explanations, they can't be valid because they would apply to other states, other parts of Germany too. So there has to be a certain problem in Saxony, particular in Saxony. Uh, I'm sure we will take, talk about that later. But uh, yeah, uh, it's a mixture, I suppose, of economical, lack of economic prospects, of a dissatisfaction with the politics in general. Uh, there's a certain national, regional pride there. So there's a, a very interesting mix and a bad mix. And there's also, for a long time, a right-wing movement that is pretty strong, stronger than in other parts of Germany. Alan Posner, the former president of the Bundestag, Wolfgang Thierse, who himself is from East Germany, said very recently that he thinks people there are, quote, more receptive to dehumanizing messages. Is this a case of in incomplete socialization 26 years after the wall fell? Or why the East? Well, yes. I mean, it has to do with communism. I mean, if you imagine, I mean, these kind, all of these eastern parts of Germany were communists. We have a similar problem in Poland, xenophobia, rabid nationalism. We have a similar problem in Hungary, in most of Eastern Europe. It has to do with the fact that there was no democratic or virtually no democratic tradition until 1989. Then suddenly the wall comes down. These people are incorporated into the West. But there was no real dealing with the question of what is communism, what's bad about communism, what's 
also bad about certain reactions to communism because they had a right-wing problem in Saxony even under communist rule and they didn't talk about it. So people, you know, there was a sort of idea in the West that give the people jobs, give the people um, uh, uh, social uh, security and so on and so on and so on and they'll sort of slowly grow into democracy. And of course with the majority this is too, this is true, but for a, a minority, I think about 20%, this hasn't happened. And this is the bedrock on which left-wing and right-wing extremism uh, is building. McConnell and Miskina, we've mm -hmm. talked about it frequently in the past, the fact that there's a lot of racism in places where there is scarcely any diversity. How do you account for that? Well, it shows that there's no actually empirical um, explanation what's going on. I mean, if you look into the situation in Saxony, in Dresden, etc., the number of refugees, the number of uh, Muslims, etc., etc., uh, it's uh, far below the uh, average uh, in, in Germany. In, in, in every German city, there are like 10 times more uh, immigrants, refugees, and Muslims, etc. So this is an ideological problem. So it's, it's not the issue of quantity, it's not the numbers, so there is no empirical explanation for that. It's not the issue of jobs and first, I mean, Dresden is doing quite well. Dresden is doing much better than many other Western uh, German cities. So even the, the economical and the social economic situation doesn't apply very much to that. So we have an ideological problem and that's why I think uh, this has been neglected for quite a long time, that there is indeed a social problem to deal with, to tackle with uh, xenophobia, to deal with uh, racism and so on. So many politicians were pretty much concerned or even the, uh, the uh, society was very much concerned with its own image rather than to tackle the issues which are uh, at hand. I want to come back to the politicians' role in just a moment, but Fabian van der Bach, you mentioned that this is a region where there's a strong sense of regional identity, a sense of self-confidence. Some people compare it even to Bavaria and say uh, that the Saxons are very proud of their state. How does that fit into all of this? Yeah, I mean, it's a very old state. It has a, a short name, Saxon. It's not like one of those mingled states like Rheinland-Pfalz or Sachsen-Anhalt, Mecklenburg, it's Saxony, it's a long tradition and it also defines itself via a strong opposition, for example, to Prussia in the past, to Berlin. So the Saxon, the people from Saxony always had the sense we are special, we are maybe somehow even superior and I believe that that they think that wasn't really recognized by the rest of Germany. So the rest of Germany hasn't recognized that the Saxons are so great. And uh, I mean, they believe that there was too much imposed on them. I mean, they had politicians exported to Saxony from the West. They had ideas coming to Saxony. But if you believe that we are the best, we can deal with our problems on ourselves and you keep on getting ideas from the outside, maybe that has led to a reaction that they said, all right, now we isolate ourselves, we reject everything and everyone that comes from the outside and we are ourselves and that's enough and we don't want anything from the outside. McConnell Miskina, I also had the feeling when I heard some of the voices of people in Saxony that they were saying, uh, we're just concerned citizens and actually we're simply taking the lead and speaking up and saying what other people are too timid to say. Do you think it's right to talk about this as largely a problem of Saxony or is there in fact a great deal of potential for xenophobic violence elsewhere in Germany as well? Mm -hmm. Are they speaking for others in other parts of the country? Uh, this is a very difficult question. <laughs> well, uh, I, in general, I don't think um, uh, Dresden is the voice of Germany. I don't believe in that. Nonetheless, uh, I don't even think uh, on the other side that Dresden is just a unique example in, in, in Germany. So, well, if there, is, um, there is a movement, let's say that. Uh, there's a movement which is, uh, 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 which is um, poisoning the, the, the climate, the climate of multiculturalism, the climate of immigrant immigration and uh, the issue of social cohesion, etc. And uh, this has not, I'm not sure whether this is, uh, the situation in Dresden is, represents the, the atmosphere in other cities. I don't think because there were similar movements in, in Berlin, like uh, the, the big movement, uh, Pegida, which is a, 
patriotic Europeans <clears throat> against Islamization. This is um, the abbreviated Pegida. And there were some others who copied this kind of movement, Pegida in, in Berlin and uh, Legida in Leipzig, etc., etc. And in none of those cities has it been successful as in Dresden. So there may be some special explanations for Saxony. Uh, I cannot tell because there is no empirical explanation for me why Dresden, because uh, Saxony has a good educational system. Saxony has, uh, and uh, Dresden and the area of Dresden is successful in, uh, in attracting uh, investors, etc. So there are quite good um, uh, preconditions for a successful uh, society. Nonetheless, there is some animosity against everybody who is not from within Saxony or maybe from Dresden. Alan Posner, we have talked a lot uh, on this program before about Pegida, the large Dresden-based movement of so-called patriotic Europeans against the Islamization of Germany and Europe. Uh, you say in your opening statement today that intellectuals are inciting violence. We did, of course, hear a lot of speeches at Pegida rallies that were very, very fiery. There were gallows, there were calls to, it availed references to uh, concentration camps and so on. Is that the incitement that you're talking about? And if so, does it still fall under the category of free speech or should authorities be, have long since taken measures to stop it? Uh, well, actually, you know, this sort of loose talk, um, incitement to violence, um, isn't what I'm talking about. There, there has been, since reunification in Germany, an intellectual movement that wants Germany to be something other than a Western democracy. And uh, these are intellectuals, mostly, by the way, from the West. Uh, people like Götz Kubitschek, um, people like uh, Jörg Elsesser. I mean, you can name names. They, they have their own newspapers, a newspaper called Die Junge Freiheit, Young Freedom. And since 1989, they've been against democracy and they've been looking for a cause to pin their hopes on. So first it was, we want to revise German history. We don't talk so much about the Holocaust, German war guilt and so on. Then it was, we are against a homosexual marriage. Now they pinned onto this one and they're using this. They're, they're using the people who demonstrate. They're using people like Pegida for their own cause. That's the point. So, um, and, and you can't, you, you know, I mean, these are people who have intellectual ideas and you have to discuss those ideas. And they don't boil down to gallows. I mean, they do at the very end. But you have to, you know, because in the end they want to get rid of democracy. But you have to take these people intellectually serious. You don't want to condescend to them and say, oh, they haven't had a job chance, they haven't had this, the other. No, these are intellectuals with a mission. But I think not just intellectuals, they also, they have a really strong language. Maybe the intellectual side remains pretty... Uh, well, serious, or they, they claim to be uh, intellectuals that have to be treated well, but most of those discourses, they take place in the internet. And w whenever you look at the comments below, you find like the strongest language. And, and it's also a question, uh, I'm sure, or I know that uh, security circles are really concerned by this radicalization of language, because they fear that that might lead to a radicalization of action as well. And we are at the stage where language has been radicalized a lot. Mm -hmm. And in the internet, in comments, you can find really, really hate speech more and more. And uh, also from people that used to be maybe in the center of society, in the middle of society, but have radicalized their language in a, in a way which is very new. Interestingly enough, if you talk about the radicalization of language, uh, it's interesting to look at the slogan that is being shouted at those rallies by Pegida. The protests have co-opted the slogan that was used by East Germans when they took to the streets to bring the wall down, namely, Wir sind das Volk, we are the people. What was once a call of courage has been a call, become a call of exclusion. Let's take a look. We are the people, chant members of the Pegida movement on the streets of Dresden every Monday. The same cry that went up before East Germany fell. But now they mean something very different. The situation has been radicalized.
Setting houses on fire isn't the solution, but it's a sign of discontent, and the politicians need to be reminded of what people think. Has Saxony systematically denied and hidden a problem with right-wing extremism? Many say conservatives in government here for the last 25 years have done just that. Others disagree. Yeah, um, the people here are not right-wing extremists or Nazis. They're concerned citizens. So are faint-hearted politicians who bow to the voting power wielded by right-wing parties to blame? What has gone wrong in Saxony? Conan Mesquina, how would you answer that question when it comes to state politicians? The state premier said this week that he doesn't see any reason to fault himself or his administration over the latest incidents, that he feels that he has continuously fulfilled his responsibility. Do you think he's right? Same procedure as every year. I mean, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, that's what I really expected. And that's the most saddest part of that. I mean... It seems like we haven't learned anything from the National Socialist Underground, you know, like the murdering series, or, which has been primarily... Uh, Let's just remind our viewers, those, that was the group that underground for over 10 years committed murders against uh, people of migrant background with impunity, basically police not uh, doing anything to investigate the murders for a long, long time. Exactly. And uh, as I heard that the police is going to investigate against the refugees who were in the bus for having provoked uh, the hate mongers, you know, I immediately thought of the NSU murder series because that was the time when people were killed. Primarily, the family members were the suspects. And so the police and all the institutions were working you know, or focusing primarily on the victims rather than on the perpetrators of... Uh, so I think we have an institutional problem. So the institutions need to be really scrutinized and then also politics, etc. So what we have here is a problem that... a denial of the reality. Uh, and then uh, the second thing is that we have uh, uh, established hate mongers, uh, especially in... in, in uh, in parties uh, which have been more or less established, like the AFD, uh, Alternative for Germany, IFD. Um, and all these parties hasn't been confronted with, with the issues. So more or less, um, Ellen has been saying that uh, they have been jumping from issue to issue. On the one side, it's very difficult to confront all these established headmongers and politicians because most of them are simply fighting against democracy not against certain issues because it was Islam, then it was the Euro, now it is the refugees. So whatever topic you have, it is against this democratic state. So how do you confront anti-democratic movements by, uh, with democratic uh, uh, issues and uh, arguments? Fabien Fontemark, in your research in Saxony, what were the conclusions that you drew about the complicity or responsibility of local officials? The fact is, uh, you say in your opening statement, uh, the government of the state has not understood that fighting xenophobia is a major task. But that extends all the way to prosecutors and courts. They have hardly been falling over themselves to right. charge and try perpetrators of xenophobic uh, incidents over the past year. Well, it they have, uh, in fact. Uh, there, there was an investigation and the, sex, uh, the people in Saxony are quite proud that they have a center of, uh, they call it operative defense center or something like that, where they actually went after some of the incidents. But still, uh, when I talk to the interior minister, for example, and ask him, so why is it always Saxony? And he said, well, we have to analyze that now. And you ask yourself, why do they start to analyze now? I mean, this is a problem for a number of years now and we had those big numbers in Saxony and over such a long time and still they lack a proper strategy and a plan and a commitment to say this is our major task we have to tackle this problem that's at the very core of our politics and that's what I'm missing there uh, on the political level and then when we talk about the state premier and when we talk about language I mean he was the one who said Islam doesn't belong to Saxony uh, and of course these are uh, um, statements that are part of a certain climate that doesn't help. And he was also the state premier who didn't go to Pegida and say, I'm against this, who 
he was at the beginning talking about, well, it's concerned citizens, we have to talk to them uh, for a long time. And, and he also doesn't uh, take notice that in his own constituency, which is Bautzen, there are 34 uh, initiatives that are actually uh, opposing this refugee shelter. So there are aspects that are really uh, not satisfying when you look at the governmental side in, in Saxony. And it's also a peculiarity in Saxony that you had a government of the Conservatives for 25 years. And this is one of the topics that we haven't mentioned before. I mean, of course, it's not a fault of the CDU. I don't want to say that. I want to judge there. But it is a special situation if one party can govern for 25 years. It has a certain uh, uh, feeling to the people and it, it creates a certain climate. Uh, one of the state premiers was, was called King Kurt for a while. So. <laughs> but, but even the, the, the recent statement on the, uh, on the uh, hate mongers, he said they are not humans, they are criminals. You cannot dehumanize these people because it is, the problem is there. So it's not, you know, it, it doesn't happen, it, it's not something like a UFO who came there and then did all these uh, uh, protests, but it is people from Saxony and they have to deal with these people. And you cannot dehumanize these people, uh, although I, 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 I don't want to weigh every word, but if he says these aren't humans, these are criminals, then you criminalize and then you exclude this really mainstream ideology. And it is a mainstream ideology which you need to tackle. In fact, that statement was made shortly after these incidents when Saxony's politicians began to realize that possibly this was a wake-up call. They have all been calling for Saxon citizens to stand up now against xenophobia, saying their state should not be identified with the angriest of its citizens. Let's take a listen. Children aren't born right-wing. It comes from the situation they grow up in and their social environment. They haven't addressed this problem in Saxony for 25 years. People acted like right-wing extremism didn't exist. That's why we're really pushing at the moment to get the people of the silent majority, which I'm convinced is there, to take a clearer, more conspicuous stand. People from all over the world who've come to our city and feel totally at home in this beautiful city, who like working and living here, are suddenly afraid to go out on the street. Alan Posner, Posner, there's an idiom in German that's been quoted quite a lot recently. Uh, it goes like this, a fish stinks from the head. If we take that idiom and look at Saxony. Where would you say the buck stops in terms of responsibility for the atmosphere that has been conducive for this violence? Is it the, the local government or does it go all the way to the federal interior ministry, perhaps even to the Bavarian sister party of the chancellor's uh, Christian Democrats? Well, no, I mean, uh, yeah, the fish stinks from the head, but that's, that's exactly the... Uh, uh, a saying that's actually been used against democracy because the things are going wrong uh, here and there, you know, and then people say, well, it's the government's fault. I don't buy that. You know, uh, in Saxony, they could have done a whole lot more. Local government could have done a whole lot more. The point is, for instance, take teachers. I think 90% of people teaching in Saxony school today, schools today were teaching in communist schools, and they still have this whole authoritarian setup. Um, and these are things that haven't been... Have you actually talked, you know, and there's this, this sort of loose talk about, oh, well, in the old days we had the communist regime, now we have the capitalist regime, and, it, it's, you know, and that's the kind of loose talk which came from, from the left wing, which is now infiltrated into the right wing. Is this... That's what I'm getting at. McCone and Miskena, you said in your opening statement that politicians are definitely creating the climate. Would you even list national politicians among those who are making mob rule in Saxony possible? Yes, not, not with intention, but all these arguments has been, uh, in fact, uh, encouraging uh, those people that are on the right side. You know, if you talk about the rule of injustice, then, then you are addressing a politics of welcoming and openness, etc. As something unjust. So whatever you do against that seems like just. That was a statement made by the head of the Chancellor's uh, sister party, the Christian Social Union, Horst Seehofer, looking to win populist uh, support there. Mm -hmm. Fabian von der Mark, people in Saxony are now saying, you know what, this could wind up being bad for our economy. International firms may leave, tourists may not come. Mm -hmm. Will that be enough of a wake-up call to get the mob under control? 
Maybe. I think uh, they have realized that they have a problem now. Maybe this was for the first time a f strong federal reaction, but it has to be a, a bigger reaction. It's still not enough. And I'm afraid uh, something even worse has to happen before people actually wake up and, and really stand up and grasp this problem as it is, as the major problem for them. Mob in Saxony, that's been this week's Quadriga. And if you would like to see more of the mayor of Dresden, we are running an interview with him in our programs on Sunday. So check that out. Thanks for being with us. See you soon.